mushroom mycelium represents rebirth, rejuvenation, regeneration. Fungi generate soil that gives life. The task that we face today is to understand the language of nature. My mission is to discover the language of nature of the fungal networks that communicate with the ecosystem. And I, in particular, believe nature is intelligent. The fact that we lack the language skills to communicate with nature does not impugn the concept that nature is intelligent. It speaks to our inadequacy of our skill set for communication. We have now learned that there are these languages that are occurring and communication between each organism. If we don't get our act together and come in commonality and understanding with the organisms that sustain us today, not only will we destroy those organisms, but we will destroy ourselves. We need to have a paradigm shift in our consciousness. What will it take to achieve that? If I die trying, and but I'm inadequate to the task to make a course change in the evolution of life on this planet, okay, I tried. The fact is, I tried. How many people are not trying? If you knew that every breath you took could save hundreds of lives into the future, had you walked down this path of knowledge, wouldn't you run down that path of knowledge as fast as you could? I believe nature is a force of good. Good is not only a concept, it is a spirit. And so hopefully the spirit of goodness will survive. Ibrahima Kasori Fofana is an expert in economic policy and public-private partnerships. When this conference was organized, Mr. Fofana was serving as Prime Minister of, of Guinea Conakry, and he graciously accepted an invitation to address us. On Sunday, September 5th, the elected government of Guinea Conakry was overthrown in an armed military coup. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres strongly condemns any takeover of the government by force of the gun. We regret that Mr. Fofana cannot join us today. If peace education was more prominent in today's world, this conflict might have been resolved through a non-violent means. Humanity is in crisis. We face a global pandemic, armed conflict and terrorism, and the greatest displacement of people in human history. Our very existence on this planet is endangered by climate change. The next generation has been forced to step up and raise their voices. Kekishan Basu founded the Green Hope Foundation when she was 12 years old to teach the UN sustainable development goals through grassroots action like tree planting. Green Hope now has over 1,000 members across Canada, Suriname, in the Middle East, India, Nepal, and Liberia. At age 12, she was elected as the United Nations Environment Program's Global Coordinator for Children and Youth. She won the 2016 International Children's Peace Prize. She is a UN Human Rights Champion, a National Geographic Young Explorer, and a member of Forbes 30 Under 30. She is only 21. The Peace Education Day Conference is proud to welcome Kekishan Basu to lead our first panel on peace education, crises, climate, and ecosystems. Thank you, Michael, and hello, everyone. I am delighted to be your moderator for this panel today, and it is my pleasure to introduce our panelists, Alexander Laszlo, PhD, who is the president of the board of directors of the Bert Allen Fee Center for the Study of System Science and director of research and programs at the Laszlo Institute of New Paradigm Research, Monica Willard, United Religions Initiative, who is the main UI representative to the United Nations and works with the UN Department of Public Information on the student observance for Peace Day, and Suzanne Midori Hanna, PhD, MFT, who is a marriage and family therapist and author. Now, today's topic is something that is really close to my heart. And uh, before we go to our panelists, I'd just like to say that, you know, 
we are living in the age of the Anthropocene right now, and we're witnessing all around us this tremendous ecological and social injustice whose impacts are disproportionately affecting uh, communities and regions that are least responsible for it. And you have the forces of climate change, biodiversity loss, human greed that is masked under the guise of economic progress, continuing to benefit a few and driving millions deeper and deeper into this mire. And then we have this pandemic, which has really amplified all these pre-existing inequalities and to create this unforeseen situation of human suffering and this lack of peace that has really shaken the foundations of our global society. And it is within these uh, communities, these societies that have usually been left behind that uh, my organization, Green Hope Foundation works in so that we're really able to reach out uh, to the farthest first. Uh, and we work with uh, communities that bear the brunt of the social and ecological violence that have lost their livelihoods, uh, that you know have been destroyed by typhoons, once forested uh, communities where pollution, erosion, land degradation, logging continue to deprive them of their food sources, forcing them uh, to migrate. And these are the ones that are also invisible often to the Western media because they're not their problems aren't flashy enough but they continue to be there and they're the ones who suffer uh, the most. And at the same time, we have victims of war and strife. And our work on peace building encompasses not just those affected by ecological disasters, but those uh, victims of strife as well. For instance, on the Syria-Lebanon border and the Syrian refugee camps, as we try to revive uh, the lost childhood of the children who live in these camps, in Kutupalong, the world's largest refugee camp uh, that houses the Rohingya refugees that was once in the news, but now really forgotten, but the misery continues. And the same situation is even there now during the pandemic, which has exacerbated these challenges in rural uh, communities in least developed countries where a complete lack of sanitation and hygiene uh, with the pandemic wrecking havoc and the complete lack of data makes it impossible to actually gauge what the numbers are and how many people are affected. And within these communities in rural Bangladesh and Liberia, for instance, in areas that are rife with social inequity and severe climate change, our efforts of peace education bring together aspects of tolerance, not just with the, within the people in their community, but also with the natural environment. So to bring about peace, we address issues that accentuate social violence and the driving force of that change is education. We've installed toilets in homes and next to the village schools to ensure that the girls especially have a safe, healthy school environment. We use education for sustainable development as a transformative tool to bring about a behavioral change and giving them the skill sets uh, to create local circular bioeconomies that ultimately leads to the restoration of natural balance. So for example, we've just opened a sewing school where we've installed sewing machines for the women and girls where they make masks, uh, clothes, bags, and are able to sell that to sustain their livelihoods. For many of them, their first source of income ever. We've installed solar streetlights to make sure that women and girls have the freedom and, uh, of mobility and safe spaces. So for us, this is how we facilitate peace education. We empower the youth and women in these communities to drive this change, uh, fostering values and behavioral changes that really promotes the ethos of living in harmony with oneself, uh, others, and the natural world, and thereby creating peaceful societies. Through different solutions, we work across 25 countries with over 225,000 people, so we recognize how important that is of different perspectives. And that is why I am so uh, excited to hear from our panelists today who all bring to this table uh, experience, different sets of expertise, and their unique perspectives. So now uh, I would like to ask each of our panelists to uh, present their uh, respective synopses of their work and how it relates to this very important topic of peace education. And I would like to start by giving the floor to Alexander first. 
Thank you so much, Tekashan, and thank you so much for the work you are doing in the world. This is what it means to be the change you wish to see in the world. So thank you again for embodying and enacting that. And indeed, this is what we're seeking to foster, as Darlene would say, to curate this kind of engagement in the world through education processes that allow us to really address the questions of the challenges of change in this kind of world we're living. If you permit me, I'm going to share a few thoughts uh, via my slides, but let me just say before I do that, that my background, as I think was mentioned earlier, is uh, in the understanding and patterning of large-scale systemic change. So I look at complex adaptive systems, as they're called, living systems, human systems, natural systems, ecosystems, right? And I'm seeing how do we co-emerge, right? How, what are the interdependencies that we have in these things? And I know that Monica and Suzanne are going to be talking about uh, exactly these questions of ecological uh, interdependence as well. This here is uh, what I would like to focus on, right? Lifelong and life-wide empathy-based learning, right? From a systems perspective, systems view of change. And uh, just so you see here, um, I'm also the uh, Vice President uh, for Education at Unity Foundation, and I'm one of the co-founders and a global ambassador for Global Education Futures. So I'm speaking to you from that perspective as well. Um, so if we think about what is happening in the world today with regard to education, clearly this is one of the most sophisticated systems for fostering human evolution. But right now it's not as optimized as it could be for the challenges of change. Sure, we've seen changes in with regard to online distance education. Not everyone in the world has access to that. And by and large, the structure of education has remained the same for hundreds of years. Um, so what we're looking at here is the, 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 how the modes and the relationships uh, are really preparing us for last century's jobs, for last century's challenges. How are we able to create the learning environments, those systemic nurturance spaces that promote the kind of engagement with the world that is needed today? I want to share with you this concept of a VUCA and RUPT because we are living, we're talking about crisis situations, we're living in volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous contexts. This is what scientists talk about in these terms. They call it VUCA situations that combine all these four elements, makes it very difficult to learn how to react, especially if you've learned memorized solutions, algorithmic answers, you know, prescribed solutions. How do you deal with novelty when it emerges? The, the psychologists will talk more about uh, how these VUCA situations are experienced as rapid, unpredictable, paradoxical, and tangled. Those are erupt uh, experiences of VUCA situations. So what happens when we live in this world that where we have challenges from the climate, from pandemics, we have political instabilities, some of these are age old, and other of these combine to create a particular environment that is exactly called VUCA and RUPT. The idea is that to meet these challenges, we cannot do it alone. We need to harness the power of collective intelligence. Why? Because each of us has blind spots. Each of us has myopias. And monodisciplinary thinking is not going to allow us to deal with these complex systemic challenges. And we also, of course, come from our own points of view, our own cultural biases. When we work with others then and learn with others and have learning environments, where we harness the power of collective intelligence, then there's a greater uh, possibility for us to really address them properly. The problem is that we often think about the world simply as if it is a, a bunch of different societies, but really it is one interconnected whole. And how do we bring this into our learning environments? Well, this idea of unity in diversity, that's the motto uh, of Indonesia. It is also the motto of evolutionary biology. The key here is that when we talk about unity and diversity, which is a key lemma of the United Nations as well, that we're not focusing on some kind of monolithic unity. Indeed, it's unity without uniformity and diversity without fragmentation. That's the richness. It allows us to develop what I like to refer to as full spectrum humanism. And if we can have an education that is dedicated to full spectrum unity, uh, um, humaning, we get into this framing of unity truly being the diversity. Okay, so a few more things. 
Ubuntu is something that is a non-Western approach coming from South Africa, the Sosha and the Zulu tribes have this essence that I am because we are the essence of Ubuntu. And as Bishop Desmond Tutu pointed out that if we had more of this, we would not have war. So how do we have this way of thinking in this collective uh, framing? For me, that involves first and foremost, education that promotes connective intelligence, knowing with whom, with nature. Uh, Keke Shan talked about connecting with self, connecting with others and connecting with nature. I, I completely agree with that. Also connecting with our ancestors and future generations. And then this helps us develop the collective intelligence, but built on the collective intelligence. And fundamentally what I'm going to be suggesting here, and I'm, I'm, I'm wrapping up, is the empathetic intelligence. This is something that's left out of schooling very, very much, uh, especially in Western frames. You know, how can we learn also the languages of relationship, developing this empathetic intelligence, relational intelligence? Um, uh, Charles Eisenstein said that this leads to the state of interbeing. It's a vulnerable state. It's a naive, the state of the naive altruist, of the trusting lover, of the unguarded sharer that we have to leave behind the seeming shelter of controlled based life projected by walls of cynicism, judgment and blame. And this really for me is about how to human well. How do we create learning environments that allow us to, to have that sense of safety, a sense of interconnectedness and a sense of interdependence. And that my friends is what I wanted to share with you today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Alexander. And I think you, I'm so glad you mentioned empathy. You're absolutely right. That is not something that is taught uh, to children from a young age. And I think, you know, that is why a lot of our world's uh, problems exist because our education systems did not uh, teach so many of us that empathy for people in planet uh, from a young age. And, you know, when you get to a certain age, sometimes it can be hard to instill that, but it is, we, we've seen it firsthand, even in with our work, that children who've been working with us for, you know, the last 10 years and started when they were six with that empathy in peace and environmental education are now uh, more well-rounded human beings than people who are just focusing on academies and separately on like, you know, protecting the planet and helping the community. So I'm really glad you mentioned that. And thank you for sharing your work with us today. Uh, I shall now uh, pass the floor to Monica to share her work and on peace education. I just am so impressed to be here with all of you uh, and learning new words and yet hitting the same kind of themes that have just touched me deeply with the peace education that I have gotten both in school through reading different novels and having been at the United Nations since 1991 as a non-governmental organization representative and attending weekly briefings, attending conferences, going to meetings, meeting people from all over the world and watching things like the Alliance of Civilization merge into an actual intergovernmental agency working with the UN. But the peace education part became pretty obvious in the late 1900, uh, 1990s, excuse me, um, when the decade for the culture of peace and nonviolence for the children of the world was coming into existence. And the Nobel laureates invited the world to shift to a culture of peace. The program and declaration for the culture of peace calls for education, but it calls for a shift into looking at our morals, into our education, our peace education, but especially into our hearts. It is so important that we use peace education to teach people about the scientific things. We are in the midst of two existential crises. We have a climate change and we have nuclear weapons. These are two things that are colliding with the pandemic, 
with our structures and our political systems being stretched. But these two particular things can actually cause the end of life on our planet. And I'm with the first generation is this post-nuclear war bomb. When it was dropped on Hiroshima, it seemed very limited. But when we look at where we have come in the past 76 years with nuclear weapons and what that means, we are truly holding the fate of the planet in our hands. And yet we are talking about things that are so useless in many ways. What kind of shoes? What kind of this? What kind of that? What are you eating? How many followers you have on Facebook? What we need to do is to look at both the science and the education and look at the fact that we, that the majority of people do come from religious and spiritual traditions. And the morality that is being taught in ways and lived in families from any part of the world has a certain amount of the golden rule in it. Do unto others as you want them to do unto you. This is a basis for peace education in so many ways, but we have taken it to bigger frameworks as we look at the work of the United Nations. We have set specific goals for the years 230, and a new one has been set for the year 2045 that the UN is just beginning to hear about, which is the total abolition by that date. A hundred years is enough. But right now we are looking at the sustainable development goals and what they have is a transformative educational and action platform that the governments have agreed on that people can pick up and look at and address the issues of hunger, of poverty, of gender inequality, of life above and below the planet. And what the SDGs bring to peace education and to the work of the United Nations is the interconnectedness. The interconnectedness of people, places, resources. We must make some new decisions. Peace will be inevitable if we absolutely treat one another in this new way of humanizing everyone. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. We must bring the core of our hearts, our love, our compassion into our actions. And to bring this life, there was a sign that was on the internet today, if we loved peace as much as people loved war, we would make a difference. And the peace education part can spark so many, many projects. We heard about the work that you're doing, Kekashan. It is amazing to see a refugee camp. The United Religions Initiative is in 113 countries and we bring people together from diverse spiritual traditions to choose peace, reconciliation, to end religiously motivated violence. And one of the days that we use to help us is the United Nations International Day of Peace. I'd like to share a quote that Grandfather Harry Bird used at the prayer vigil for the earth for years and years. And that is a heartfelt prayer is more powerful than an atom bomb. So one action that I would like to educate you on today for peace education is to take the minute of silence on the International Day of Peace and at least once a day, every day throughout the year to practice living peace, to bringing it into our hearts and to sharing it with the world, with just breathing in, with a deep breath, we can do this together. Breathe in world, breathe out peace. When we start with a guided thought, we can move into actions that we can't just plan right now, but will be inspired. And peace education is a way of planting seeds.
It's ways of plant, planting seeds on how we think, how we speak, and particularly how we interact with one another. I invite you to look at the de UN Declaration for the Culture of Peace. I invite us to really look at the sustainable development goals because our governments have signed on. So by 2030, we can take a transformative agenda and build peace locally and globally. But most importantly, I ask you to look at what the military budget is doing and call for a shift of spending. Let us unite in action to get rid of what can destroy peace in a minute, what can destroy our planet. And let us build this new, interactive, caring, empathetic world by working together to address the issues that are needed, such as food, education, jobs, right employment, care of the animals. We need our home. We need peace. May peace prevail on earth. So yes, thank you for speaking about that. I think the world still doesn't have enough knowledge about the SDGs and how important this framework of action is. So uh, thank you for sharing your uh, perspective with us today. And hopefully International Day of Peace is celebrated not just on that one day, but every single day. And with that, I'd like to uh, now invite Suzanne to take the floor and share your perspectives. Thank you, Kekushan, <clears throat> and Monica, and Alexander. I'm so inspired and honored to be here with all of you. <clears throat> um, my work as a marriage and family therapist has taken a lot of different um, stages. Um, I began <clears throat> as a lowly graduate student um, who studied von Bertalanffy and cybernetics, not Freud, not even Carl Rogers, but uh, marriage and family therapists in my generation cut our teeth on Bertalanffy and cybernetics. And um, at that point in my life, I had no idea that my great uncle was killed in the Hiroshima bomb. Yes, of course I knew I was part Japanese, but the fact that I didn't even know about him or his history or the history of my ancestors is because of one major thing, fragmentation. Um, knowledge, families, um, all kinds of systems were fragmented that led to me not finding out until I was 40 years old that my great uncle had uh, been killed in the Hiroshima bomb. Uh, <clears throat> now I gravitated to marriage and family therapy because I thought that that was the end all and be all. Um, it had a systemic focus. It was not about fragmentation. It was not like the Americanized uh, mental health system at that time when Freud came over in 1909. Um, the Americanized version of Freud ended up becoming exported around the world as, as the Americanization of mental health, which has really only fragmented our approaches to mental health. And um, so I began to see how social systems were really so connected to well being. And I began calling myself a clinical anthropologist. Uh, and that's because I began and still do believe that mental health for all people is situated in social systems. The psyche is not in isolation of social construction. The psyche is made from social construction. And, um, and so as a clinical anthropologist, I began to look and see how people and problems were situated in cultures and in systems of power. <clears throat> that led me ultimately to understanding that even in marriage and family therapy, we can be fragmented. And uh, my, my study of trauma led me into that. And this is where peace education comes about for me. I began to see <clears throat> through my study of neuroscience, how peace really begins in the body. 
and, um, and then how it pervades every social system that um, <clears throat> we are um, embedded in. I began to look at violence prevention from a biopsychosocial perspective, but I now call myself an ecosystemic practitioner uh, because um, all the others don't really capture the interrelatedness. Bronfenbrenner started thinking that way in the US, but frankly, he came along later than uh, von Bertalanffy. And so er early on, um, <clears throat> the early systemic scientists uh, were looking at the interrelatedness uh, and biology is part of that. What I, what I desire is the cross-fertilization and cross-education among the systems, among global systems, as well as the microsystems that I um, traffic in right now. Um, and to be able to see how, for instance, this is not, this is not to, you know, an analogy on my part. I firmly believe that radicalization is a neurophysiological addiction. And that as people grow into um, a radicalized state, definitely it's in the body. Definitely it begins from a groundswell of these various factors from attachment to isolation, to devaluation, to disruption of community, and those build on each other. Well, there's a neurophysiological component to all of those and a neurophysiological component. I would recommend that before any sort of mental health, traditional mental health psychiatric intervention. If we could turn these inside out and upside down and have education then that, that goes across um, these different domains of empathy so that at each level, we look at the biological underpinnings that become the sticking points and then look at how to, to uh, transcend those into that sense of belonging and um, uh, identity. And then um, by so doing, uh, in my opinion, peace is the opposite of rage. Peace is the opposite of isolation. We cannot have true peace in isolation. Now that doesn't mean I'm not a meditator and some of that kind of thing, but, um, but that's just the underpinning for peace. I see peace as very much an interpersonal, um, transactional. Um, it is not something in the psyche, it's something in the body. And then to the degree to which we can um, promote those uh, those ways that are good for the body and good for the globe all become, in my opinion, then the ecosystemic uh, approach to peace. So thank you very much. I'm sorry to. No, absolutely. Thank you so much, Suzanne. And I think your perspective is one that I don't think a lot of people look at a piece or just even gener addressing generational trauma and mental health in that way. So thank you so much for sharing your perspectives with us. And you're right, the education uh, really needs to move beyond just one single way of thinking, which is, you know, often Americanized. And that goes for, I think, all aspects of how we often view things, but actually moving beyond that and uh, going back to what uh, as some of our panelists uh, talked about our ancestors, our traditional knowledge, but at the same time, also new ways of thinking that comes from our, our younger generation. So thank you so much for sharing that with us. And with that, I shall now pose the next question, which is why peace education? So I'll I think from my perspective, we have a a global population that's you know set to cross a billion. We've uh, more than half the human race now living in cities. We are uh, witnessing resource depletion, inequity, and a mag of magnitudes we've never witnessed before. And the worst part is that we don't seem prepared for it. And as our panelists have uh, mentioned today, our education systems too have been tailored to prepare young minds to only think about. Uh, themselves selfishly only to think about one's progress and 
uh, what I've personally seen is to just place individual excellence as the hallmark of success. And it's this lack of empathy, you know, that one needs to address. And that is why uh, in my line of work, I've seen how important peace education is because it reminds us the need for tolerance, for equity, for togetherness, and for social good. And it teaches us to think about others before oneself, the joys of sharing and how together we can become stronger. And one of the lines that really stood out to me, I think, Alexander, you mentioned in your presentation is unity and diversity. And that is the beauty of the human race. And sadly, it seems something that we have forgotten in our quest to just uh, go faster and bigger and better. And that is what our work at Green Hope Foundation operates on, the same mantra about bringing about social equity and environmental regeneration for the greater long-term betterment of society, including all age groups, not just something that adults discuss, but something it's that, that young minds also uh, discuss and learn from childhood because they're the ones who are most impressionable. And it's in these early years that one must sow the seeds of tolerance, of sustainability through peace education. And that's exactly what we do at Green Hope Foundation. So uh, I'd now like to ask our panelists, again, why peace education? And once again, we'll go in the same order. So Alexander, the floor is yours. All right, <clears throat> just alphabetically here, Alexander. Well, <laughs> um, now these are, it's almost, it seems to me almost self-evident. Why, why would we want to be nice to each other? Why do we want to get along? Why do we need peace education? Hmm. But it's not so self-evident because we've created these kind of systems, these social systems, the socio-political systems, socio-political economic systems, and the way in which we have an extractive economy where we use the environment for our own benefit without really thinking, how are we giving back? So all of this has created a kind of situation of untenable stress, non-sustainability. And so when we start to think about peace education, it is truly this relational way of being and, and, and learning how to relate. I mean, this is something I think that all of us picked up on and, and I wanna to get to that maybe at another point, but this, this dimensions of relating, this is this conscious, it brings this systemic consciousness that, that Suzanne was also talking about now, how we can relate to ourselves. Now, often we don't, our self-talk is very negative. Now, often people, because we've been influenced by others who say you're not worth anything. So how do we relate to ourselves? It's something that Suzanne was talking about a lot. How do we relate to each other? Right. Monica was talking a lot about these questions also, and this is your work, Sharon. How do we relate and create healthy, not just sustainable, but thrivable communities, right? Um, and then there's relating to nature, because we are not living in nature on the planet. We are part of nature. Nature is us. We are swimming in it. We are surrounded by it, and it is going through. We are nature as well. So how do we learn this language? of nature as well, because we're not speaking it very well at the moment, and this is part of peace education. And then something we're mentioning again, uh, Kika Shan, is about relating to our ancestors, you know, relating to our ancestors, because we are their hope, we are their vision, and how are we feeling that? How are we being descendants of a long line of not just our, uh, our human species, but a long line of all that has come before us? How are we fostering this narrative of life thriving on this planet? And how are we being good ancestors? See, that's for me is a key question of, of mm. peace education as well. Because we are right now, we are future ancestors right now. There are unborn generations which will at one point be thinking of us as their ancestors. So we're ancestors in training. How are we doing? How do we learn how to be in relationship with those? those generations that are coming. And of course, then there's the relationship to the sacred, the relationship not just to seeing everything in monetary terms that we can somehow put a price tag on or benefit from or hmm, uh, trade or sell, but seeing life as sacred, seeing each other as sacred. So finally, just to say, it was Ben Franklin who said, um, if we don't hang together, surely we shall all hang apart. So this is, the, the, and why peace education, we need to learn how to get together on this 
relatively small planet. It's a vast place, but we are now all over it as a species. And we have to learn how to share. We have to learn how to get along. Because right now we're not going anywhere else, we're here. And how do we learn how to be together? This is something we haven't mastered yet. And peace education is critical for this. Thanks. Yes, absolutely. I think peace education, of course, starting from a young age and ensuring that our young minds know. And then they, and I really liked what you said about how we're all future ancestors. Or yeah, and I think that you know it reminds me of uh, the definition of uh, sustainable development from the Brundtland Report of 1987 that said that it meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. And that in itself, like, kind of alludes to the fact that we are. The future ancestors and it's about this legacy that we leave behind but also how we treat our present so that we can have that good healthy standard of living that benefits us and the planet at the same time so yes and that is of course why we need peace education right now so thank you alexander uh, monica uh, thank you. I've just learned so much from all of the speakers. This has just been a wonderful exchange. I think we need peace education now, particularly during this COVID time, because it is a time for us to shift. We are not preparing people for the industrial revolution anymore. Our schools had to change somewhat. We haven't gotten there completely yet. When I think of the extinctions that are possible with the predictions with climate change right now, when I know that it would take minutes to destroy most of the population on earth with a nuclear exchange that would move into all of the weapons going off at one time, it, it's set up in a way to destroy the planet. What does it take for us to know that mutually assured destruction is insane. And that whole idea of mental health or security based on an insane premise is not tenable. We cannot go there. And yet, what does it take for us to reach and be that empathetic person we need to be, to add love to situations? And I remember the Kinshasa trials after the genocide in Rwanda and when we hear the stories of the horror and when we know the projections of the horror, how do we get rid of this addiction? And it does start as small children. We looked at South Africa and yet by looking at South Africa, we certainly didn't look closely enough at our own country. Maybe George Floyd and Brianna Taylor and others will get us to do the introspection that we need to do. We need to look at it and address the inequalities. So join us for the International Day of Peace on September 21st. Practice that day, practice leading up to it, and practice it daily from then on. May peace prevail on earth. Amazing, thank you so much, Monica. And yes, I think that you know the pandemic has given us that perspective on where we need to uh, rectify our mistakes of the past and like I think peace education is a wonderful way for us to actually move ahead and create a new normal instead of going back to uh, the normal that actually brought us to where we are uh, right now so thank you for sharing that uh, with us today and uh, finally Suzanne thank you so much for uh, the inspiration that um, all of you are giving me. Um, why peace education? Let me target education. What is the process of education and how does that happen? I believe that education is our salvation. Um, some decades ago, um, psychotherapists around the world but in particular in the US, we had this elitist idea that the therapist should not educate, that instead these 50 minute hours should be um, filled with some kind of psycho analytic dynamic dialogue that even Freud said at the end of his life didn't get the results that he had hoped, that it wasn't effective. But the Americanization of Freud 
lasted so long <clears throat> that we continued with this elitist idea. Nowadays, one of the most promising um, approaches, for instance, to helping people with schizophrenia is a multifamily educational approach. There's a sense of community that develops within an environment of education. And I have come to see that education, not therapy, is the great equalizer. There's, there's way too much um, of a stereotype and way too much stigma attached to the Americanization of Freud and mental health. That's something to be fixed rather than to be healed. And Monica's talked about healing um, in such wonderful ways. <clears throat> Alexander has also talked about these elements that go into healing. And the reason I believe that education now is, our, is, is the great equalizer and is our salvation is because people can come together without being looked upon as though there's something wrong with them that needs to be fixed. And instead, there is something going on between all of us that needs to be healed. And when you put that in an educational setting, not only does it keep the rational brain engaged, and once that happens, by the way, then the fight, flight, freeze elements of our brain can calm down. So <clears throat> Monica was speaking to me when she was asking us to take a couple of breaths and just, you know, let some calm, let some space come in. <clears throat> uh, because I'm a pretty competitive person. And really, if we break down the neurophysiology of fight, flight, and freeze, on the fight side of things, it's really competition. Um, and certainly it's war, but on the way to war, it's competition. And um, there is no culture on earth, unfortunately, that is more competitive than the United States. But again, the sense of isolation and then the sense of <clears throat> competition, which has not just been necessary, but it really has, 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 is now worshiped in all kinds of ways as a certain type of God. And um, so the sense of competition that um, precedes war and that completely eliminates peace, um, I believe can be incorporated <clears throat> into education, again, head start, head start children in preschool learn about sharing. And um, they, they learn about conflict resolution in, and again, the most simple ways. Well, if we take education and begin to educate people in environments where they are calmed down, there are certain questions um, that are very calming. Um, there are very there are questions that are that are peaceful. Everyone wants love. Um, everyone wants a sense of belonging. Those kinds of questions and that kind of education. What will bring that about? And then, of course, the gospel according to <clears throat> ecosystemic work would suggest that. Um, how do we, you know, even for a, a preschool child, how, how do we bring about sharing and cooperation? <clears throat> and, and so then teaching uh, people at all ages about how an ecosystemic process can bring about peace and can bring about belonging and a sense of identity. Um, that actually, in my opinion, uh, is why education can be and should be our, our salvation and um, using it in environments where people can actually be soothed during the conversation rather than activated. Um, and, and the ecosystemic model doesn't blame individuals for character flaws. See, ecosystemic thinking is much broader than the individual. So we're not throwing individuals under the bus. Um, we are, in fact, educating um, 
educating our fellow humans as to how all the parts work together and how they can work together in order to create peace. Uh, and, and that I believe is why the education and then why the peace, <clears throat> in my opinion, um, <clears throat> there's a need for education that will help us to identify vulnerable people before they become radicalized or criminalized. And it's through the educational system, not the diagnostic system. The diagnostic system will never, ever identify people that are at risk. So that's why education, in my opinion, throw out therapy as we have known it in America, uh, why education and, and why education about peace so that we can find people who are at risk and the most vulnerable uh, and direct our, our efforts in an ecosystemic way toward them. Absolutely. Yes. And I really liked how you said that, you know, education is going to be our salvation. And that is so true because, you know, if you don't have the knowledge, you can take action and not just like the tradition, like the hegemonic Western knowledge that is kind of uh, put upon us, but the knowledge of, you know, our unique lived experiences and the traditional knowledge and just like moving beyond that Western kind of uh, worldview. Thank you so much, uh, Suzanne. And, you know, all of you have shared such amazing perspectives today. And just to uh, wrap it up, just very quickly, uh, the last question that I'd ask, and maybe in like uh, just one or two minutes, imagine it's a year from now, your peace advocacy efforts have borne fruit. What does that look like? So, you know, we'll go in reverse order this time. So Suzanne? In 10 years from now, again, People who are isolated um, will be identified. Um, tribes and communities um, who have become fragmented and cut off will become connected uh, across boundaries. <clears throat> and then attachment, as, as I know it in human development, is not enough if you're only attached to other social systems that are then promoting radicalization. See, attachment can happen um, in many different forms uh, and to many different groups. And so in 10 years then, um, <clears throat> I, I would like those social systems who have developed their identity, both from, from tragedy um, and from then, um, you know, uh, positions of extremism, um, those are also people who have had um, losses that have led to this. So in 10 years, <clears throat> I will see my enemies be offered a humanizing process for their losses. And instead of dehumanizing the losses that occur, personally, socially, tribally, um, nationally, instead of dehumanizing losses, uh, we will humanize the losses that all people experience and value their right also to grieve those losses. So everyone has a right to love, everyone has a right to safety, and I, I would add then everyone has a right for reparation of their losses and to grieve those losses with dignity and empathy from everyone, including their uh, would-be enemies. I would see that your generation um, would be really heard and integrated in a way that makes a difference because the innovative creativity and care that I am seeing with young people around the world uh, changing how people work, how families are functioning, how things are moving. I think we need to learn and to make sure we do not go back because back was really an emergency for some people. And we need to look and learn from those emergencies and to find 
a common ground, but also to protect our common ground. And I think it's possible. I think it's inevitable in some ways. And I also think that when we do it with love and joy and compassion, it will be a much easier shift because the constant divisiveness, the I'm right, you're wrong, is not going to get us anywhere. Um, even when I know I'm right, <laughs> I think uh, I need to listen and to find out how is it, what am I missing that they think they're so right? And so I think it's both personal and collective, and I'm really counting on the collaboration between those of us who've done things certain ways and made advances in peace education, but looking to the younger generation to help us bring it out in new ways or to celebrate it in new ways or to, um, to just have a, a fertile ground that something is growing in that we can share together. Crazy. Thank you, Monica. Alexander? Well, well, you know, I think we're doing this now. There's this beautiful expression from Pablo Neruda who, said, who talks about recuerdos del porvenir, right? Memories of things yet to come. Mm -hmm. Memories of things yet to come. And in a way, we here I, I, I are sensing into the beauty, the potential, the aliveness of that future that we know is possible. There are many possible futures right now, but feeling it, sensing into, remembering, remembering memories of things yet to come. Wow, how powerful that is. I think we are in a, in a kind of a triple birthing process right now. And if we're looking out 10 years, 20, 30 years, you know, what, what we give birth to, I, I, but it's, it's a triple birthing. It's not just giving birth to some kind of future. We're also midwifing it very clearly. We are midwifing that which is coming into being. But we are also that which is being born. It's important to see. <laughs> we are that which is being born. It's not so this is for some future generation. They'll they'll live it. No, you know what? This is us now. We have to be what we think the future needs to be now, to be the change we wish to see in the world. So I think that uh, you know, Peace Education Day is about that practice. You know, and Monica, you were talking so much beautifully about how it is this practice leading up to and then engaging in those moments of connected, of silence, of meditation, and then bringing peace into your way of being as a practice of being. It's not just, well, I'll do it on this day. It's, this is what peace education truly is about. What I'm hoping for then in, in, in 10 years, let's say, is that we will look back and see this time as the great awakening or the great realization. People sometimes talk about it as a great turning, but I think it's actually a more, hopefully, a coming to our senses. And I mean, really, not just to our reason. We talked about Descartes and all the decapitation that went on with that frame, but how, how are we coming to our senses, knowing what is right, how to be human well with each other? And I think what I see emerging then in 10 years, what I love to see is kind of living, learning communities that are natural, that are part of the, nature is our big teacher here. So how, how does nature thrive? And learning to be in these ecosystemic dynamics, I think that, that'll come about when we really practice more collective intelligence, this understanding, this great awakening to our, our interdependence, and then coming out with this sense of interbeing. That doesn't mean giving up our individuality, no, not at all but it means adding to our individuality, a sense of collective being, our interbeing. And I think this can be done through empathy-based education. The kind of things we've talked about here it involves listening. It just doesn't involve just transmission of knowledge in old fashioned education, but involves listening into and truly caring about the human with whom you are and the ecosystems with human who you are and the human that you are. And this is about how we can be the systems we wish to see in the world. So I'm hoping that in 10 years, this becomes the most natural thing. It's just what we do. And I think education will help us to learn those practices for how to be this way. 
absolutely. Thank you, Alexander. And thank you so much to all of our panelists for sharing your views and perspectives with us. We need peace education and we need it now. And uh, a quote that has always uh, been the driving force of my work, and it's actually what inspired me to start my work at seven years old, was what Robert Swan said, at environmentalist Robert Swan said, and that is the greatest threat to our planet is the belief that someone else will save it. And that is something that is applicable to, uh, well, us addressing any of our world's challenges. So it is extremely important that we start that process of uh, doing uh, uh, dedicating our lives towards people and planet now and you know panels and discussions such as these give me hope for that future so thank you so much once again together let us make this peace education a reality and ensure that peace education day international day of peace and all of these international days they are celebrated every single day so that we can truly create a sustainable and empathetic world for all thank you so much once again Refugee, 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 in your world, I'm a refugee, in your world. Shelter, please. Bring me shelter. I will not harm you. I would shelter you. I am only what you are. I am only what you are. I am only what you are. What you are. What you are. Imagine your Imagine your unbreakable the world was broken, no more rules to protect you. Who was I? 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 In my world, I was standing strong in my world. shelter i will not harm you i would shelter you i am only what you are i am only what you are i am only what you are what you are what you are imagine your unbreakable world was broken no more rules to protect you Imagine your unbreakable world was broken and no rules to protect you. Imagine your unbreakable world was broken and no more rules to protect you. Refugee, refugee, refugee. Maria Francisca Cortez Solari is a Chilean businesswoman, philanthropist, conservationist, 
She founded Philanthropia Cortes Solari, FCS, a philanthropic project that promotes the sustainable development goals through science, education, conservation, in a context of climate crisis. Please welcome her to the first Global Peace Education Day conference. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on which country you're in. Thank you very much for this invitation about such relevant topics as are education and peace in the world. I represent a foundation that has been working for 20 years in the issue of integral education, being a pioneer in education that has developed an offering for quality development in Chile, Latin America, the Caribbean, and the world. I would like to also say that today, after these 20 years of work, we are training agents of change in society to help move us towards a model of integral and sustainable development. Our interest is also to influence the quality of education and the public policy of our country, promoting an integral education of the human being for an experiential approach at the service of the educational community in formal and non-formal education in Chile, Latin America, the Caribbean and the world. What have been our challenges? What challenges have we been facing today as humanity? First of all, profound environmental changes related to social and cultural issues that are also shaping childhood and youth. And we need, as adults, to take care of the future with respect to all these changes. Then we have the urgency of climate change that is already happening which really forces us to acquire new skills that we need for these new challenges that we are facing. Also, COVID-19 has caused the greatest disruption in history in educational systems. We see over 1,600 million students from more than 150 countries being affected by this. So as we can see, this is a collective issue. UNESCO estimates that 23.8 million children and young people are at risk of dropping out of school and not having access as a result of the economic crisis, the pandemic, and all these changes we are having, like this paradigm shift that forces us to rethink ourselves. What has been our learning as a foundation? It has been challenging at one point. We have been here for 20 years. We wanted to change education, so we want to find new ways. Therefore, we have to realize that we are nature, that its conservation is a personal and collective commitment, which has to do with our self-care, with the call to care for nature, for survival, not only of human beings, but of thousands of species that are endangered. We've also understood that culture is a key to understand our origins, the sense of belonging to the place we have come to, what is our land identity. On the other hand, it was also important to highlight and involve science in education, because scientific evidence also helps us to make decisions with awareness and also educate the young people in this new education connected with nature, 
Education is fundamental in the world, and we must understand that the human being is an integral being that needs to learn from experience, because experience is what transforms you. And finally, spirituality as something big that is within all of us in our program, where values, care for nature, conversations are essential for coexistence and the construction of new societies that are sustainable. What element do we think a new education should include? And maybe other people with other identities would have other elements. But we defined these four elements. First, that the experience has to be transformative, that is, it has to reach the self. How are we going to change climate change if we are not able to change what we have inside of us? So in order to cause change, we have to change ourselves. We also need to look at education with a multidimensional approach that incorporates the environmental, social and cultural aspects. We also need to shape education in suitable environments. And we have personally understood that nature has been our great teacher as a great natural laboratory for learning. The concept of a human being from an integral perspective, where in this case, us as a foundation speak of a human being who has a physical aspect, who has emotions, who has a mind, and who also is a spiritual being. And from there, a developed human being model that I will show you later. We understand that this paradigm shift that we are experiencing is not a change of today. It has been coming for many years, 30, 20 years. We have been in a linear paradigm, subjected or fixed in content, in uniformity, in consumption, in a number of things that have gotten us basically lost in our egos. We have always thought that the ego was the great challenge that we have to work towards as humanity. But to get from the ego to the echo, which is the circular paradigm where we talk about skills, about the collective, about the importance of collaboration, where connection is essential, where the call is to work on the self, understanding that it's a world of diversity, of care, of self-care, and to look at what is an ecosystem and understanding that, yes, a human being can find happiness. As I said before, our model has been based on four basic core ideas, understanding that this individual, this human being is interacting, as we see him here below, interacting with the territory where the territory also differentiates him. But we also see that this human being is spinning in his territory. We see that he is interacting with the universe. We're speaking of four dimensions, as I mentioned before, body, emotion, mind, and spirit. We return to the same image. And when we talk about physicality, for us it is essential to understand the development of skills from a thirst. And when we speak from there, it's essential to understand that the body is also essential when it comes to learning. Understanding about breathing, presence, meditation, body work, sports, the presence, the understanding that we are a body on this earth, that also needs to be taken care of. Then, in regards to emotions, we speak about feeling, about attitude, and it's very nice to look and see that in diversity, each person or individual 
also has their attitudes and qualities that differentiates them from others. In regards to the mind, the ability to understand, to acquire knowledge, to distinguish, the capacity to speak, the abilities of the mind, of intelligence, of the use of wit, the capacity to be trained, a mind that creates, that uses language to express what we want to say or do in the world. And finally, we talk about the spirit of transcending, of the values of a human being, values, ethics. And we talk about spirituality, where we understand this integral being linked to nature, where it participates with nature, where that spiritual being is perfect in its wholeness. And well, we want also to show you here some images of our dreams. These are images that we created about 10 or 15 years ago, and we said, perhaps we have to draw first what we dream of. And we start by saying that we dream of an education that values learning from the body, from the body, the emotions, the mind, and the spirit. It is an education in contact with nature, which we value as a great classroom. An education based on the fact that all life forms in the universe are perfectly interconnected. An education where science and innovation are at the service of the community and the future and development of our countries. An education that values the process more than the installation of the educational content. An education that considers land conservation as a fundamental learning value. Love for our land, love for our place in history as well. An education that enhances knowledge, ancestral knowledge, and also the trades that nowadays are so relevant to this new paradigm. An education that values the development of skills, also the abilities and distinctions that show us the value of the universe of life. An education that recognizes culture as a key piece of identity and development. And now, in this last image, I want to invite you to imagine. And for that, I ask you to close your eyes, to get in touch with your heart, to breathe deep three times, and to connect briefly with that depth that we all have. And I want to invite you to imagine. Imagine all of our children living transformative educational experiences oriented to the self. Imagine a society with an educational process connected to nature. Imagine that learning is really a pleasure. Imagine a society that goes from ego to echo. Imagine that living together is learned by living together. Imagine that an education is the main alley of peace. Imagine that all of this we are talking about today really became a reality. And in this reality, everything depends also in our courage and what each one of us does. Therefore, this reality also depends on you. Thank you. Thank you.